Hi and welcome to the first video of AP Physics 1 at Oak Grove High School. Uh, this section is going to center on a topic that will be the introduction uh, and more specifically scientific concepts of the introduction. Uh, there will be some math uh, that we previously done in this class but this is going to get us concentrated more on the um, science, uh, science terms, um, you know, equations, and other concepts like that. There will be some math, but it will all be related back to scientific knowledge. First of all, we need to talk about measurements. Uh, when we say measurements, what we're really talking about is trying to take something from the actual physical world and bring that concept down on a piece of paper and summarize it with some kind of um, uh, measurement, where it's numeric or something else like that. Um, we're going to concentrate more on numerical results than, you know, pretty and ugly and all that kind of stuff like that, which are more qualitative. And so uh, one thing we have to do, though, is that we're, we have to understand that we're limited by the amount of precision. Um, we're limited by the amount of precision that instrument that we're using, right, and our own ability to, uh, to judge this. All right, so this, um, so this measurement device over here has a certain quality to it, right? And, um, and, and even how we uh, measure it and how we use it and how trained we are to use it uh, does play a fact. Um, so uh, one thing that we cannot do, we cannot report having a higher value of precision than the instruments that we use. And I get this a lot because uh, students like to uh, try to be fancy or something else like that. And they'll give you a number that whatever their calculator spits out at 6.146 nine two so on so on um, in reality uh, we're we can't get to that level of precision if you're just doing something like um, you know multiplying uh, something times pi or something else like that you know we, we can't get to that level uh, so what we see here is um, if we look at our measurement uh, right here we have a uh, let's see a ruler um, we can make some estimates from that all right, so we're, we're using this device, which has its own limitations, and then our own kind of process of that has its limitations. Uh, let's, so let's see, if I um, get this here, and let's say somewhere about right here is what I'm thinking about, about the, what that measurement is. All right, and so this is in centimeters here uh, up top. So I could say, okay, 8, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, in between 8 and 9. So I will give that just a good general, um, how about I give that a uh, 8 point, let's see, 8, and this right in between 8 and 9, so I'll give it 8.85. That's in centimeters, okay? So 8.85 centimeters. Now, you know, I can't, I, there's no really detail I can go further than that that really gives me more information than that. All right, I'm kind of stuck with that. That's the information that I have. Um, you know, adding a bunch of zeros after that or even adding a bunch of different numbers does not, um, I don't have that accuracy to play with. So the way that we handle that when we report our information is that we use something called significant figures, Okay. And significant figures here, so digits that are reliably known, right? So d digits that are reliably known. Um, so that's going to help me not only give my information correctly, but, you know, also report back on, you know, how I, how I collected it and with what um, precision. So here we have some calipers, all right? You can get some, uh, you know, outside dimensions, or you can rearrange it and get some inside dimensions using this side. It doesn't matter. But the idea is that we have a, a value that's given to us here, and if I were to multiply this value times um, 0.62491, right, uh, the idea is I can't really, um, you know, I, I can't, This the idea that this is only accurate to uh, two decimal places does not change, and I have to keep that significance as I go forward. So let's just do an example here. Um, if I use these calipers and I find out that this has a diameter, a diameter right there of 35.27 millimeters. And let's say I want to find the area. Well, how do we find the area of a circle? Um, an area is pi r squared. Okay? So first of all, what do we do? 
uh, we have to go and we have to get our um, di uh, so we'll go from a diameter to radius. All right, so we'll go from diameter to radius. Uh, so it's 35.27. I'll divide that by 2 to get my radius. So I get a radius of uh, 17. Point, let me do this. Radius of 17. Point, uh, six three five millimeters. Okay. Now, see. Okay. Right here, I've already added. Now, all of a sudden, I have this new decimal spot out here. Right. Well, what I'll tell you is that while we do mathematical processes, it's okay to keep that. All right. We're not going to start shortening it until we get to the end. And what we're, our end is is area. Okay. So we're going to keep that around. So now my area is equal to pi 17.635 and that's going to be squared. All right now if I actually look up pi, I have a type pi into my calculator and hit enter, it's going to say pi is 3.1415926654 and we'll probably even keep on going past that. All right. So the idea is there's a whole bunch of precision to pi and pi as far as we know is an infinite number but we're not going to necessarily deal with that and give an infinite number as a result. So what we're going to do now is do this calculation. So I say, okay, I do pi times 17.635, and I'm going to square that. Now what does my uh, calculator give me? The calculator gives me 977.8. And go down here, zero. I like to do that with my zeros. Uh, three, one. That's what my calculator gives me. Even other calculators may give you more or less. The idea is that number would technically keep on going uh, forever and ever. But I cannot report this as this many millimeters um, squared. All right. So I can't report that as that value because it just doesn't. It doesn't make sense because again, my I was limited. To, to two decimal spots in my initial measurement, and I have to reflect that. All right, so I have to reflect that, and more spe more specifically, I have to reflect the idea of my significant figures what I start off with, and we'll go through this process and how you do that. Okay, here are rules for significant figures. All right, first of all, we're gonna go line by line. All right, so we'll look at then we'll look at this line, uh, this top line first. Uh, all counting numbers one through nine are significant. All right, so those are count called counting numbers, just the one through nine. All right, so if I look at specifically go here, um, let's say I have uh, these two right here. So first thing I say, how many counting numbers are there? Numbers that are one through nine. And this one I have one, two, three, four. So this one has four significant digits or significant figures. Okay. Next one right here, how many counting numbers? One, two, and three. All right, so this is easy. I have three significant figures. Okay, this is the easy, that's the easy one. Now, let's go to my next rule. Zeros can be a little tricky. So first, next rule. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, zeros that come before the first counting number are not significant. All right, so okay, let's look at some examples there. So, pan over, um, I have 0 0.002, okay, first of all, I say, find my counting numbers, how many counting numbers, I have one counting number, all right, go to the next rule, zeros are not significant if they come before counting numbers, okay, and, that, and they're the only ones before, so, Zeros come before the first counting number are not significant. There's only one, so all zeros before that are not significant. So uh, if I just look at how many significant figures do I have, I have one. Okay. Next, come over here. And I have, um, see, I find my counting numbers. I have nine and seven, right? So I have two significant figures. I have a bunch of zeros, but they are before the first counting number, which is this nine. So then I don't count any of those. It right? doesn't matter how many zeros are there. They are not significant. So I have two significant figures for this one. Next rule. Zeros that come in between counting numbers are significant. And here's the key thing right here. 
is in between. All right, if they're in between, they are significant. So let's look at an example for that. All right, so right here, I have 1,704. So how many counting numbers? One, two, and three. All right, I have a zero here, so I've got to think, does it to the left of the first counting number, like if there was a zero out here for some odd reason, that wouldn't count, all right? But uh, this one happens to be in between two counting numbers, in between there, so it does count as a significant figure. So how many significant figures do I have? One, two, three, four. All right, also here I have one counting number, another counting number. I have a zero, all right? It is in between two counting numbers. So that is significant. So I have three significant figures here. All right. So we talked about things zeros that are um, zeros that are before. All right. Zeros that are before. Zeros that are in the middle. And now we're going to talk about zeros that are after. Okay. Zeros that come after the last counting number are significant if there is a decimal point visible. This is the strangest one. It's actually still ambiguous even after this rule. So the idea is best shown by example. So here I have one, two counting numbers, and I have a zero that comes after the last counting number. Basically, the rule is if there's no, if there's no decimal spot, which there is not right here, all right, if there's no decimal place there, then that is not a significant uh, value or significant figure. So in this case, I'm still limited to just two significant figures. By the point of somebody putting a decimal spot right there, or even doing decimal and then another zero afterwards, indicates that there is precision available there. All right, so now I have one, two, and then because this decimal spot is here, all right, I have a third uh, significant figure right here. And the idea is that I don't know if this 170, I don't know if that's, um, it was ambiguous when it's left like this, because it could have been rounded down from 175, uh, 174, right? It could have been rounded down, or it could have been rounded up from 160, 168, right? Something like that. Um, or it could, just, could have just been spot on 170, right? Or it could have been rounded up from 169.4, Right. So we, uh, there's a whole bunch of ambiguous stuff that happens. All right. So this is gets a little bit strange here. So here's some examples here. Uh, I'll do the uh, first one with you and then give you some time. I'll pause it and then um, allow you to um, do the rest and then you can uh, check your answers. So the first one, let's look at that. So I'll zoom in here, the first one. All right. So here we go. Let's see. Do my counting numbers first. One, two, three, four. All right. Now, how many zeros have I got? One. I got one. Oops, don't want to do that. I got one, two, and three. All right. This one comes between two counting numbers, so yes is significant. All right. These two right here, all right, these two, they come be between counting numbers, so they are also significant. So each one of these digits are significant. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven significant figures. So seven. All right, I lied, and let's do this next one below it. Um, all right, so how many counting numbers? One, two, three. All right, now I got two digits before, two zeros before the first counting number. So those are not significant. No, 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 no. All right, I have two that are after. I go to my rule and I say, is there a decimal place visible? All right, these two right here. Is there a decimal place visible? Well, the decimal spot's all the way back here, but yes, it is visible. So in that case, these are counting numbers. I'm sorry, they're not counting numbers. They're uh, significant figures. So I have one, two, three, four, five, five significant figures. Okay. So right now, I will pause and let you uh, fill out the rest, and then we'll check back and see. Okay, so here we have um, all of our answers. Uh, let's see, first we can look at the ones up here. Um, I have one, two, three counting numbers right here. 
uh, these ones. Oh, sorry, we already did this example. So let me let me go to something uh, a little bit different. Okay, let's go down in the bottom left here. I've got one, two counting numbers. Um, then I have one, two, three, four, five zeros, right? So the first thing I say is I look at the third rule of zeros. Say zeros after the last counting number uh, are significant if there is a decimal spot. And there is a decimal spot, so they are all significant. Um, let's move on to this one right here. Uh, I have one counting number. I have another counting number. Okay, a zero is to the left of the first counting number is not significant. The zeros that are in between these counting numbers are significant. And there is a zero to the right of the last counting number, which is significant because there is a decimal spot visible. Now this one is a tricky one, like we had seen before. I have one counting number, which is one, and I have a zero afterwards, and it's not significant because there isn't a decimal spot. But I still don't really know um, what my precision really should be. All right, so this is these are very ambiguous. All right, if I were to put a decimal spot right here, that would change everything. All right, and that would actually make it two significant figures. But again, when it's just like this, there's not much you can you can tell. So you have to assume one significant figure, um, or depending on something else like that. And, and the books will try to kind of guide you through that uh, when we do uh, homework online. Okay, next rules for significant figures. Uh, we can find the significant figures of each number, but then we got to think about how we're going to deal with those when we put them into equations and whatnot. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the rule of multiplying, dividing, uh, that means doing square roots also, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to round, um, to round the answer to the same number of significant figures as the input with the least number of significant figures. And the key thing is that we're going to look and scan for that least, uh, that least number, sorry, that least number of significant figures. Okay, so let's look at that in an example here. Two examples. First, I find out significant figures of each one. This one has one, two, three, four counting numbers, so it has four significant figures. This one has one, two counting numbers, so it has two significant figures. All right, so go back to my rule. Uh, I well, first I'm going to multiply them together, right? And so when I do that in my calculator, I get 20904, okay? All right, 20904, all right? That's not going to be an acceptable answer. So I'm going to have to do a rounding here, and I round it to the least number of significant figures. All right, so I got four and I got two, all right? And so two is my smaller number of uh, significant figures, so I'm going to round this to that number, all right? So if I round this to only two significant figures, that means two, one, zero, 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 21,000, all right? because my precision was limited by um, this, this 2 right here. Okay, so let's go over and do this next one. All right, 395 is 1, 2, 3 significant figures. Um, so at 3, All right, 32, uh, 0 0.0032. Uh, I have two significant figures here. I have um, zeros to the left of the first uh, significant figure or counting number. Uh, so those are not significant. Uh, so this is just two. So if I look at three, I got three and I got two, right? So I'm limited by the smallest number. So my answer is going to have two significant figures, right? So I multiply those two together and I get 1.264, okay? And I have to round that to two significant figures. So this would be one and two significant places. So my answer should be 1.3. All right, not not 1.3000 zero, 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 because that shows that it has things like that uh, have um, add precision to that, but 1.3. Okay. Next rule: adding and subtracting. Okay, you're going to round the answer to the same number of decimal places as the input with the smallest number of decimal places. One of the key things you can kind of look for when you do uh, do this is, is basically the smallest, the smallest decimal places and then the smallest significant figures. So remember, least number of sig figs for multiplying, smallest number of decimal places for, uh, for adding. 
Okay, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, in this case, we're not going to count significant figures. We're going to count um, decimal places. All right. So I see here uh, how many decimal places? I have one, two, three decimal places. So it says three decimal places. And then this one has one, two, two decimal places. So the, the, the least number or the smallest uh, number of decimal places is going to be this two right here. Okay. So when I do this, um, I should get 1.112, one, right? But I got to round this to two decimal places, sorry, or, or yeah. And so that means I'm going to have to round to just these three. So my answer is 1.11, one, one. all right? It sounds strange, but yes, that is true. Okay, uh, next one here is uh, point. Uh, 0, 0, 0097, this has 1, 2, 3, 4 decimal places. This has 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, I'm in luck. I know exactly what to do here. Uh, so I get uh, 0 0.01 and 0, uh, 4. I think I just did that in my head and make sure. Yep, this is true. Okay, now i got to round this to the least number. Well, they're both four. That's easy enough. So I just keep it the way it is, four decimal places, four decimal places. Okay. The only thing that's exempt from these rules are basically exact numbers. So like uh, pi for that case. Um, you know, pi, you know, an infinite number goes on forever, so you don't basically... You know, it, it's it's exempt. We don't kind of shorten it, and we don't do some other things like that. Um, there's other cases that are, I'll go through in classes uh, that you see here um, in class time um, with uh, more examples. Okay, here's some examples, and I will pause right here and let you uh, work on these, and then I'll come back with a bit of exp explanation. Okay, we're going to take these step by step, uh, actually go through our PIMDAS, everything else like that. Okay, let's look what, what we have here. Uh, so first of all, we'll go, uh, go through this. Um, I have 1505 plus 13.5, uh, which gets to this value right here, but at the round to the lowest number of uh, decimal places, so uh, 28.6. All right, and then I do multiplication with that. Uh, I have uh, three significant figures uh, right here, 28.6, and I have two significant figures right here. And so I got to round my answer to that same value. So 286 is what my calculator gives me, and 290 is what I have to round to since I'm limited by these two significant figures right here. Okay. Uh, next, I have this uh, has two additions here, and they're being multiplied by each other. So the first thing I do is I add these two together. Uh, this one has three decimal places, this one has four, so I have to round to just three. So I have uh, this to begin with, and I round it down to uh, three decimal places. Right Now, if I look at this from significant figures, because I'm about to do this multiplication, uh, I have four significant figures here, and I have to keep that in mind. Uh, here I have addition. Um, I have uh, 1065 plus 800. Uh, again, I have no decimal places here, so I can just put them together, right? I don't have to worry about it as long as I don't have uh, decimal places. So, uh, no change between here and here. And also look, an 81865 has four significant fig figures. Take this value, four significant figures, multiply by this value with four significant figures. Keep the lowest number of significant figures. Uh, my calculator gives me this answer right here, which I must then take it down to four significant figures, which is one, two, three, and four, and then round this, this gets rounded down uh, to this value here. Okay, next topic is scientific notation. Um, I like to say that uh, you know, scientists are, you know, are lazy, um, and uh, that we you know, don't like writing a bunch of extra zeros, but that's not quite true. Uh, you know, it's just a good way to handle things. So let's look at some examples here. 
124,000. All right. Uh, if you wanted to, you know, show this with um, scientific notation, you could shrink it down to uh, 1.24 times 10 to the fifth. Well, if you actually look at this length and that length, it's not that much smaller. Um, it's just that sometimes it's easier to deal with this when you're talking about like estimations and trying to figure things out like that. All right, but this this case right here, 0 0.000034 versus this is this is a lot more um, is a lot easier to deal with, right? Versus this and trying to keep track and, and count your zeros, all that kind of stuff like that. So this is actually a, a better way right here to, to deal with those. Um, if I have to convert from one form to the other, uh, let's say if I have to go from the form on the left to the form on the right, then I'm talking about moving my decimal spot. All right, so you move your decimal spot so there's only one number to the left. Um, basically, there's one number to the left of the um, of, uh, of the decimal. All right, so in this case, I want to move it uh, here. So let me zoom in a little bit. 124,000. I want to move it to where it's just one. It's right here. All right, so I have to move it from here. One, two, three, four five spots, okay? Now every time I move it over, I'm really moving a tens place, so what you end up having is that this is now 1.24 1, 1 and then times times 10 to the fifth, and this is basically how many spots that you moved it over, right? This is how many spots you moved it over, all right? So if I move it uh, if you move the decimal to the left, right? So if I move the decimal to the left, the exponent will be positive, okay? But on the other hand, if I go here, I have to move this decimal here, right? And move it to the right. One, two, three, four, five. I get 3.4, right? Which is 3.4 here. It's been moved to the right, so therefore it is a negative uh, exponent, okay? So if I move it to the decimal to the right, the exponent will be negative. Okay, so here's some examples. I'll do the first one uh, together, and then I'll pause for you to finish, and then I'll uh, come back with the answers. Okay, so let's look at this first one. I have 1.02 times 10 to the third times 1.2 uh, times 10 to the sixth. So if you remember, um, we multiply the front numbers together, and then we add the exponents uh, to each other in this case. So let's zoom in and then just write this out. So this is the same thing as 1.02 times 1.2, right? Then it's times 10 to the, and I had what, uh, to the third and to the sixth, so I will add those together, 3 plus 6. Okay? So the calculator tells me 1.02 times 1 1.2 is 1 point, well, it says 224. So let me see if I have two sig figs on that one. So I get limited to that. So it's 1.2 uh, is my estimation there. Okay? Because I only had two significant figures here. See, already bringing in some of those lessons. And um, and so and I have now I have to say times ten to the three plus six is nine. Okay. So let's pause here and let you finish the rest, and then we'll come back to this right here. Okay. Welcome back. So here I got some examples. Um, first of all, um, the first ones are pretty direct, especially this one. So let's go on to here. Uh, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by 1 point, uh, 1 times, sorry, 1 times 10 to the 4th. 2.3 divided by 1, all right, is 2.3. And that gets multiplied by 10, and then it's minus 4. And it's division, so it's a minus whatever this one is. So minus 4 minus 4 is negative 8, which you got right here. Now, the thing is, significant figures, I had to round this to two because this one only had one significant figure right there, all right? Okay, now this one right here, 8.2 times 10 to the negative third, 3.44 times 10 to the negative sixth. Okay, I can multiply those together first before I divide by this. 
Um, so what I'll do is I got 8.2 divided by 3.44 times, then it's this one plus this one, right? So negative 3 plus negative 6, which is the same thing as negative 3 minus 6. So this, these two come out to 2.38. This one comes out to 10 to, uh, to negative ninth. Now, what we're going to do is we're not going to round in the middle. All right? We're going to keep track of our significant figures. We know basically at this point we should have, uh, this one had two significant figures right here, and this one had three, so this should result in two significant figures, but we're going to hold off on that. All right? So we know that at the end, uh, we're going to compare this uh, right here after we do the next process and see this one's two significant figures. We're going to keep it at 2.38, okay? Uh, then it gets divided by 5 times 10 to the negative ninth, so I get 2.38 divided by 5, and I get uh, 10 to the negative ninth, and then divided by, which means um, you subtract uh, 9 uh, right here, so right here. And so I get uh, 0 0.476 times 10 to the negative 18th. Okay, now I have to account for significant figures. Uh, so I had two left over right here, even though I was showing three, just to help along the precision. Uh, but I only had one right here, so that one's going to trump it. So I have to make it with just one significant figure, which is what I have right here. Okay, one thing we do with uh, science is we have uh, units. And then we have a specific type of uh, units that we'll be using, SI units, Système International, French. Uh, and uh, we're going to also signif signify things with prefixes that will go with those units. So the, um, the base I SI units that we'll use, we'll have derivative units after these, but these are the base ones. Uh, anytime we have time, the base unit is in seconds. So essentially that's what, you know, we're going to be converting a lot of things to seconds. And probably what you want to go ahead and remember, uh, well, you know, you should already know that there's 60 seconds, you know, uh, in a minute. And then there's 60 minutes in a, you know, an hour. And you should go ahead and start thinking about, okay, there's 300, 3,600 seconds in one hour, right? Um... Those are those are the same. We'll we'll talk about unit conversions here in a bit. This will be a common uh, a common conversion that we'll make. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the next one. So I have length, um, right? So uh, this one this one's universal here seconds, but length you know we're used to dealing dealing with feet. All right. So we will have to transition to that. So roughly three point one something like that feet is in a meter. Um, but we'll have to be using, uh, we'll be using meters. We have meter sticks in the back of the room, and we'll use, if they do have inches, you shall not use inches, you shall use only the meters. Next one is mass. Instead of pounds, we're dealing with kilograms. This one's kind of odd because it actually has a kilo, you know, which is, uh, which we'll see here is, means a thousand, so it's a thousand grams, but it is a base, all right? The gram is not the base. The kilogram is the base, and we have a video that shows um, where that came from in class. Okay, for current, this is when we get to the end. The very end, we have ampere, which is the rate of rate flow of charges, and uh, capital A. But for the most part, this is what we're going to be dealing with um, in the first part of the class. <clears throat> okay, now if we go to prefixes here. All right, so we if I have a number, which I have, uh, let's say these things right here. Uh, let's say let's start off easy, uh, ten. All right. I could express it as 10. I could express it as uh, this factor, 10 to the f 10 to the first, kind of like our scientific notation, All right? Uh, or I could uh, express it using the prefix of deca, and the, or the symbol of deca. So let's say this is um, uh, 10, and I'll make it 10 um, 10 meters. Okay, so I'll make it 10 meters right here. Uh, I could express it as well 10 meters. Let me back up here, and I'll say 10 meters. I could say this is 10 to the first meters. I could call this a decameter. Let me zoom in here and say deca, um, decameter as one word, right? And that's, that's what it is. Or I could say a... <laughs> It sounds kind of strange, but uh, a decameter abbreviation, 
All right, this is my abbreviation for meter, this is my abbreviation for deca, and I can just put those together. Um, let's see, other examples here we have, um, let's say, uh, we don't use hecto all that much, but that's what it would be. Uh, let's say kilo. So here we have 1,000 meters. I could also express it as 10 to the third meter. I could also express it as um, kilo. Kilo is the prefix for 1,000. So kilo meter. But we don't really say kilometer, we say kilometer, right? And then the last thing I can do is I could, instead of saying kilo, I could just shorten that down to K. Instead of saying meter, I could shorten that down to M. And KM is my abbreviation for kilometer or uh, kilometer. I could have a million of something, and that's a uh, megameter, right? Uh, I can express it in all kinds of different ways. Um, just keep track of lowercase and uppercase. Capital mean, capital M is going to mean mega. Uh, lowercase is going to mean uh, meter. Okay. Uh, giga goes higher than that. Again, these three right here kind of follow if you're into computers at all. A kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte. And eventually, your uh, hard drives even go further to terabytes. Um, okay. On the other side, uh, this is where it gets a little bit trickier is... Um, Deci, right here, and decimeter, um, and it'd be DM for that. Uh, a centimeter, right? Uh, a lot of things you think about centi, uh, a centipede has a hundred legs. Uh, a centurion is a um, is a fighter in Rome that there's a hundred fighters per group, so he's a centurion. A century is a hundred years. A cent is one one hundredth of a of a dollar. All right, I can go on and on, uh, but we actually use this one quite a bit as long as you think about that. So 100 centimeters is one meter. Um, so that means, uh, yeah, so this is the same thing as that. And that would be like a centimeter. Uh, one million, or not one millionth, but one thousandth right here. This is also a thousandth. I'm going to know what saying that. Is a millimeter, right? And I would put two little m's next to each other, and the first one means milla, and the second one means meter. I go f smaller and smaller than that, one millionth, right? So this is one million, 10 to the 6. 10 to the negative 6 is one millionth, right? That gets me down to micros. And this would be a little Greek symbol called mu. I'll show you what mu looks like in a larger scale. Right, that's one way to write it. Kind of, if you don't shorten that other tail, it's kind of like that. Um, so that is mu. A micrometer, and so you can see how the font kind of looks like with that. Uh, you can go further than that, and you have nano, and you have pico. This really gets into when you talk about wavelengths and, and um, things like that for light and um, electromagnetic and radio and so on. Uh, and then we have, um, we're dealing with those. I'll say for the most part of this class, we will be dealing with this range. Mega through... Milla, right here. So this is the range that we'll be dealing with for the most part of class. Uh, I would say deca and deci. Uh, definitely not deca. We we're not going to deal with too much in hecto. But mega, kilo, um, uh, centi, milli. Uh, go ahead and commit those to memory because guess what? We're going to be using those a lot. And um, they will be on your equation sheet, but again, anytime that you can just quickly go through it in your head, you're going to save yourself a lot of time. Uh, and, you know, keep track of these and look for them. Look for them because that may be your first step is to convert from uh, meters to millimeters or kilometers to meters or something else like that or hours to seconds or something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, so we'll be keeping these as we go forward. Okay, next we'll talk about converting units from from one to another. Uh, this can get you from feet to meters, from you know our English system to the metric system, or anything else like that, or miles to kilometers, or even hours to seconds, and so on, so on. So as long as we follow these rules, we can uh, get it done. Uh, so let's see, we can convert one to another uh, using dimensional analysis, and that's just a little trick, little you know thing that we call it. Um, you know, dimensional analysis, okay? Um, 
there's a lot of different ways to do this, proportions and things like that that you may have done in the past, uh, cross multiplying, so on and so on. But I think this is the best for more complicated uh, conversions that we'll do. Step one, place your current value over one, right? So remember, you know, I could, the number two, that's the same thing as two over one. Um, five marshmallows is the same thing as five marshmallows over one. It's still the same thing if you divide anything by one. But we're just going to place it over, over one. Step two, multiply by the conversion factor. We repeat as many times as needed. So, for example, if I want to go from hours to seconds, right? I can go from hours to minutes, minutes to seconds. So right? each time I do that, I can do a conversion factor multiplication as many times as needed. Uh, eliminate units. We're going to be crossing those out to confirm your answer. It will be in the uh, units that you want. And then the last step is to finish the arithmetic to find the answer. So basically we'll be going along, canceling units as we go. And at the end, what this means is just multiplying across top, multiply across the bottom, and then do that final division. Uh, best done by example. So let's here, look here. Uh, convert 60 miles to kilometers, kilometers. Okay. Um, so I have 60. First step, all right? I put 60 miles over 1. Next step, I find a conversion. Well, uh, what the conversions will be, you'll have listed, will be something like 1.6, let me move that over, 1.61 uh, kilometers equals 1 mile, mi, mile, okay? Uh, and, but when I do that, I, just, I can re rearrange it. Because remember, anything divided by itself is 1, right? So I can put this as this, right? 1.61 uh, kilometers is 1 mile, right? And this value up on top is equal to that value right there. So if I divide each other, then it's basically 1. So what am I doing is I'm taking this value right here, 60 miles, and I'm multiplying it by the number one, but I happen to be converting as I do it. Okay, so um, so I could also look at that and say that well, uh, one uh, my uh, alternate one is one mile is equal to one point six one kilometers. Okay, and this is the same thing, right? So I'm gonna have to you know look and see which way I arrange it, whether which one I put on top and bottom, and then what I'm gonna look to do is at the end is that I want, I want to cancel my units with tops and bottoms, okay? So I have my 60 miles, right? And then I have uh, 60 miles right here, right? And then I have one mile here. If I have uh, this on top, and it cancels with that one on bottom, okay? So I'm going to get some red right there. It's going to cancel with that one on bottom. All right, so step one is I did this right here. Step two, uh, I did my cancellation. Then step three, I multiply across the top. So 60 times, 60 times 1.61. That gets me 96.6. Right? And then my only unit left is kilometers. So I'll get rid of some of this stuff here. Alright, my only unit left is uh, kilometers. I multiply across the bottom, 1 times 1. Oh, there's no units left. Um, okay. And, uh, oh, not done. Uh, so I reduce this. So 96.6 kilometers is going to be my answer, but then i got to look at this. This is 60.0 miles. I have to keep that precision going forward. So then I have only two significant figures, so I have to express this as 97 kilometers. Okay. All right, so this is what I used right here. It's all equal to 1. Okay, here's some examples. Um, I'll go through a couple of these, um, and I'll leave the rest for in-class time, and then practice that will definitely be in the homework, and, I mean, really every other part of the class will be using this. So um, on the left here, I have some common unit conversions from inches to centimeters, feet to meters, miles to kilometers, miles per hour to meters per second, uh, so on, so on, so on, all right? Um, 
Uh, one thing I will note is that uh, I will probably do this number five here, and I'll do it in um, a little bit different way. I won't skip to um, to some of this, but um, I'll show you how to do that in, here in a second. So let me do the, let's say, um, let's do, using this information, let's go millimeters to kilometers first. Okay, this number two right there. All right, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and I'll say I want to do 1.67, and I want to express that in kilometers. So I'm going to zoom in so I get a good way to do this. Uh, one, so 1.6, let me write this better, 1.67 millimeters over 1, first step, okay? What do I start off with? 1.67 millimeters, and that goes over 1. Now, I need to multiply this. Now, I need to get to kilometers, now I can't go directly there, so what I will do first is I always convert, if I have to do something like this, I'll convert to this base unit. Right? The base unit in this case is going to be meters. Okay, so I need to convert this to meters. Well, I know that there are a thousand millimeters in one meter. Right? Milla means a thousand in this case. Uh, the other way I could say it is one meter, um, sorry, one times ten to the um, negative third meter is one millimeter. If I looked at f looked from the um, thing from the previous slides, um, so either way, it doesn't matter which one I use uh, as long as I um, keep this straight. So what I am going to use is I'll say there's a thousand millimeters in one meter. Now I want my millimeters right here. I want these to uh, to cancel, right? So I got to pick: Do I want millimeters on bottom, or do I want millimeters on bottom, or meters? Well, if I want these to cancel, I need millimeters on bottom. So I'm going to write whatever that is: 1,000 millimeters, and I'm going to, on top is one meter. Okay. Now, if I actually keep track of stuff, and as I go along, um, so this and this will now cancel. So now I have meters. All right. So meters is my unit. Everything else is canceled. So I need to keep on going though. Uh, I need to get to kilometers. So now I got to say, okay. Um, now I got to use the fact that there are one thousand meters is one kilometer. Okay. And next thing I have to think about is how do I arrange this? Because I need to multiply it right here. If I have meters on top, then I need meters on bottom so that it cancels out. Okay, that's what I'm looking to do. Cancel out. All right. So I say, okay. Uh, I need meters on bottom, so that means 1,000 meters is one kilometer. Now, meters, meters cancel, and then I can continue. So now I have uh, this, so I multiply across the top. Let me just move over, multiply across the top, 1.67. And my units, these two have, these two have gone away. Right, so I'm left with kilometers, 1.67 kilometers. Okay, uh, then I multiply across the bottom. Uh, a thousand times a thousand. Well, that's uh, a thousand is one times ten to the third. So it's one times ten to the third times one times ten to the third. So that's the same thing as ten to the six. So it's one times ten to the six. Okay, and there's no units because those had canceled out. All right, and the last step is I finish my math, my arithmetic, whatever you want to call it, and so my answer is 1.67 times 10 to the, uh -huh, and I got to the 6 on bottom, so it's going to be, when I do this, bring it up, it'll be to the negative 6. Last thing I think, look, and I say, does this make sense? Well, if I start off in millimeters, which is a very small thing, and I want to think about kilometers, which is long distance, then it makes sense that this would be a very small number of kilometers, right? So a millionth of a kilometer would get you down to a mil, uh, millimeter, okay? All right, now let's look at this down here, and it will be a little bit more complicated. 50 miles per hour to meters per second, okay? So first thing I do is 50 miles per hour, and I'm going to go from MPH, and I'm going to go to miles per, and per just means, you know, divided by hour, okay? So I'm going to go 50 miles per hour over 1. Now, I don't, there's a couple ways to do this, and maybe I'll do both in this video here. 
uh, let's let's do I'll do both. Um, first, I want to do it uh, the way that uh, is a little bit more universal. Okay, and what that's going to be is that uh, I'm not going to treat and convert and change this. All right, so I'm going to change this instead of doing um, miles per hour as in one unit. All right, if miles are divided by hours, and that's what that per means, I mean this is 50 miles. What does that mean? It means, you know, you're going 50 miles in one hour, okay? The same thing, 50 miles per hour, you go 50 miles each hour, all right? So this is what I'm going to use for conversion. And now I have two targets I need to get from my miles, all right? I get my miles into meters, and I need to get my hours into seconds, okay? This is probably one of the more complicated ones you have to do. Um, so what I'm going to use for that, I'm going to use... Uh, Something I just know from uh, from running about 1.6 kilometers is equal to one mile. All right, the other value you can see is 0 0.6 um, miles is one kilometer or something else like that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use okay and get to kilometers. So I need uh, if I have this fact that's down here, and I have miles on top, then I need miles on bottom right here. So I'm going to need one mile, okay, and then 1.6 kilometers on top. I got miles on top and miles on top, so they're going to cancel. All right, now I have kilometers on top and hours on bottom. Okay, so I'm going to stick with this one because I really want to get this to meters ultimately, all right, and get this kilometers into meters. So I'm going to convert now using 1,000 meters is one kilometer. Okay, so I got to put set this up now, uh, and again I got to look and see. I need to cancel this kilometers, all right? So I need if I have kilometers on top, I need kilometers on bottom here. That means uh, one kilometer here and one thousand meters here. Okay, now I can cancel my kilometers, and I got meters on top, and I got still got hours, meters on top, and still got hours on bottom. All right, so now I'm going to convert this hours into seconds. Uh, so for that, I'm going to use 3,600 seconds is equal to one hour. And this is a shortcut you should probably go ahead and, and remember. And um, so now I'm going to put that out here. Now I will say times, well, let's see. If I got hours on bottom, all right, I got hours on bottom here. So I'm going to need hours on top. So I use one hour as what goes on top. Okay. So one hour, 3,600 seconds. Okay. Now I can go back and let me make sure I can cancel. So if I have hours on uh, bottom here and hours on top, they're going to cancel. All right. So I got you know, miles canceling, I got kilometers canceling, I got hours canceling, which leaves me meters and seconds. So next, uh, sorry, um, next step is to uh, multiply across top, multiply across the bottom. So multiply across top, that is 50 times 1.6. And I get 80, okay? Oops, sorry, i got to multiply that also by uh, 1,000. So that means 80, 80,000. Okay, so 80,000. And that is in meters. Okay, multiply across the bottom, which is 1 times 1 times 1 times 3,600. Okay, now 80,000 divided by 3,600 is 22.2222222222, okay, um, but we are going to use that and say that is, um, so it's 22, and I'm going to look at my sig figures, uh, technically across the top, um, I started off with 50, um, I'll, I'll pretend that's 50 point, you know, you know, whatever, so I'll keep two significant figures, uh, also, on across the bottom, I have two significant figures, so that's going to be 22, um, basically, meters per second. All right? 
and this is I can I can double check this uh, one little quick conversion to remember is you know if I look here um, right here it says one mile per hour is about 0.447 meters per second so if I really just did that quickly and I'm not going to go through the whole process again but if I just said one mile per hour is 0.4447 0.447, so that means 50 times 0.447, uh, 22.35. So this is a little bit of an estimate here, um, and um, so they're pretty close. Um, the other thing to remember, if I have something in meters per second as I'm going forward, I'm just trying to do a quick estimate. If I kind of do a 2.1 or double it and then add a little bit more, then I'll get my... Um, I'll get my value in, in um, miles per hour. So say 20 meters per second is roughly about, I double it in a little bit more, about 44 uh, miles per hour. You know, 10 meters per second, you know, 22, something, something like that. Okay. We will be using this quite a bit. Okay. All right, which brings me to the next thing here, estimation. And this is a, uh, an acquired thing. It's not, it's hard to teach in this way. Um, we can do estimations. One of the easiest ones to do is just estimations based off of, um, uh, you know, um, orders of magnitude, or you can call them scientific notation. You know, a thousand divided by a hundred. That's ten to the third divided by ten to the second. So it should be around ten, or you know, or something like that. It's just a rough estimation. Uh, the other thing we look at is using some uh, approximate conversions. All right. So right here on on the um, on the right, you know, I have some approximate conversions here uh, that we will use quite a bit, right? So a kilogram is about two point, eh, a little bit over two pounds, right? So if I had to mentally go back and forth, I'd say, well, two point something pounds is a kilogram, right? Uh, length um, is about three feet, really about 3.1, but you, you kind of get the idea. Uh, if I keep that in my head, I can kind of quickly go back and forth and make it say, is that reasonable, right? And that's the question. Is this reasonable? Because your answers will probably be in SI units, right? One of these three right here, or one of these. Um, and so you got to think, is that, is that reasonable in my life, even though I don't use SI units, you know, as I drive down the road, All right? So uh, three centimeters, one inch. Um, so uh, let's see, five kilometers, about three miles. And eh, I don't like that one so much as just, 0.6, right? If you have any, how many miles divided, you know, and then multiply by 0.6, or, yeah, I guess, I guess this is fine, right? Um, meters per second to miles per hour, about two, right? So if you get an answer that, you know, um, you know, a guy on our roller skates, or, you know, is going, um, is going 30 meters per second, then it's not really reasonable that um, that is, you know, a good, that I mean that's that's sixty something miles an hour and that's probably not reasonable. Uh, likewise, kilometers an hour to six, uh, to miles per, miles per hour. Uh, I got that point six or whatever. Um, you can do that. Okay, so um, here's some examples. Is it reasonable for a bike to be going thirty kilometers an hour? Okay, that's the same thing as if I did this right here. Uh, that's the same thing as eighteen miles an hour. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's you can get in a long leaf trace, you can go 18 miles an hour pretty easy. Uh, is it reasonable for a man to be 250 centimeters tall? 250 centimeters tall. Well, 3 centimeters is 1 inch. Um, so that is roughly about uh, 90 inches tall, um, maybe 80-something. Uh, I would r maybe rather go from uh, meters to feet. So let's see. This is the same thing as uh, 250 centimeters is 2.5 meters, um, and then that's going to be how many meters times three feet? Uh, so that's going to be uh, six. No, that's going to be 7.5 feet. Uh, is that reasonable? Uh, no, no, it's not. So. If you ever got that as an answer, then most likely you did something wrong, or the the answer or the question was messed up to begin with. But most likely you did something wrong, so you might want to, um, you know, go back and correct it. Next, we have symbols and symbolic manipulation. And the idea is that you know, if you look at your formula sheet that I gave you at the beginning of the year, um, you have you know this very complicated mess, and we we actually 
we're going to use this. Um, this is one of the biggest adaptations when it comes to physics is using stuff like this, you know, day in, day out. Um, if you look here, I got squares, I got, you know, subscripts, I got superscripts, um, I got little, you know, arrows, right? I got, you know, words down here, Greek stuff and math stuff and all kinds of whatever. Right? I got A here, but also got, you know, uh, A here. What's the difference between an A with an arrow and an A with a C? Well, that's all going to come out in the class, uh, and it's going to be step by step. All right? So it's complicated right now, but hopefully it'll get better as, as we go. So typical symbols used uh, and their equivalents. So first, let's look at this uh, one by one. Um, you know, we, we use... Um, so symbols uh, like X, for example, uh, X is position, right? V, V is velocity, right? So, but we have these things called uh, subscripts, right? Now, subscripts are the things that go underneath, okay? Underneath. So this example right here, this is what I use commonly. Um, this is a, um, you know, this right here is initial... So X means position, and I means initial, so this means initial um, position. Now, different books, different people use different things. The AP actually uses zero, right? That means my zero position at time zero, or my X naught, or position, initial position. It's the same thing. It means the same thing, initial position. So if you see a little zero there in your equation sheet, it's the same thing as initial. Um... If you don't see anything uh, on some a position like that, it's actually going to be a final, uh, especially if you have both the initial and a final position in our word problem. Um, again, the same thing here. We got velocity, all right? Uh, v naught. It's same thing as initial velocity, uh, or just velocity here. Also, just means final velocity. Um, now we have, we'll get to this when we get to vectors. Anything that goes in this subscript here is going to describe what that is. So this is velocity, and it's specifically just the x component of velocity. We'll get into that very heavily when we get into vectors. Right? This shows me the y component of velocity. Um, so you can see some of that already when we get into here. Um, you know, I've had to read this uh, the way it is. Um, you know, I got... Uh, the x component of velocity, right? And there's no, um, there's nothing out here. I, you know, what we're going to write is an f, right? So f for final. So this is the x component of the final velocity because there's nothing there. Uh, this is the x component of the initial velocity. That little zero there means initial, right? We were going to do it typically in class with an i, but, you know, this is what the AP thing is. Plus the acceleration, the x component of acceleration. Uh, times the time, all right? The final position equals the initial position plus the um, uh, the x component of the initial velocity times time plus one-half the x component of acceleration times time squared. Oh. So you can see how complicated this gets, but we'll, we'll be taking it step by step, okay? Uh, a few other symbols that we'll use. Um, first right here, we have sigma, all right? This just means the... Uh, the sum of, right, the sum of whatever's in front of it, right, so um, F in this case means force, uh, um, we, this is our symbol for vectors, which we'll get to in, um, in a couple chapters, talk about vectors, and this is, means the X component of the, of that vector. Um, some common Greek things we'll use, uh, theta, very common basically for all of our angles. Uh, sometimes if we have two angles, we'll use phi as a second angle. Um, sorry, I'll probably use it better, like phi. All right, so theta and phi are, are going to be angles. Uh, delta, delta means change of, and that always means, um, okay, right here, final minus initial. Delta always means final minus initial. Okay. Chain. Uh, so that means, and you know, we read that as change of change of position, change of time, change of um, you know momentum, whatever that is. Uh, if it's ever something lost, then it's actually opposite, initial minus final. But we're going to be dealing mostly with uh, deltas here. 
Right. One thing we will have to adjust to is the, um, the idea that we're going to have to rearrange these equations that we have here. Right? We're going to have to be able to rearrange, solve, let's say solve this one for r. Right? Uh, solve this one for delta t. Right? So we're going to have to do some algebraic manipulation. And we have some examples. Okay, so here we go. Um, so let's do the first one together, and then we'll walk through the other ones. Okay, we're not going to use any values. We're just going to rearrange algebraically using all of our things that we learned in algebra one, and then uh, go from there. Okay, so like solve for a of x, right? Or the x component of acceleration. So this is what I'm solving for. Remember, these are all one. These are all single units here. Okay. There's no way to separate the x's and the o's and you know whatnot, you know around here, right? So these are all. This is one unit. That's one unit. That's one unit, and that's one unit. All right. So first thing I need to do, I need to get this guy by itself. Uh, so I'm going to subtract this from both sides, right? However you want to think about uh, doing that. So next step is v x minus uh, v x naught. All right, subtracted that from both sides, and then on this side, I just have a of x divided by t, or multiplied by t, okay? Still just trying to get this one alone, so I'm going to divide both sides by t. Okay, algebra-wise, these cancel, right? All right, those cancel, and so uh, what I end up with is on my left side, I have vx minus vx naught, all right? And uh, divided by t is equal to a of x. And so now I have solved this for a of x. All right, so this is telling me a of x is equal to my final velocity minus my initial velocity divided by time, which is something we will use. Let's get a little more complicated here. Okay, solve for t. Okay. First step, I need to take these right here. I don't like them on this side, so I'm going to subtract them to the other side. All right, so this is what I get, minus vx naught t uh, equals one-half ax uh, t squared. Okay, um, so let's see, I'm going to take this right here and then divide, oh, say this right here, and divide it on both sides, one-half ax, and get my t alone, I'll get t squared alone first. So, um, so that's going to divide this over here. Actually, I'll just rewrite it again. Well, no, I'll explicitly write it out. Here we go. Um, one half ax. Okay, and then this side one half ax. Take it over here, and then I'm going to get. Um, so I'll get x. I'm going to do parentheses minus x naught uh, minus v x naught t. Right, and then underneath is a of x, and then I had uh, right here I had one half, so anything divided by one half is the same as multiplying by two. It's just an easier, easier way than keeping that extra fraction stuff around. Okay, and that's going to be equal to t squared. And I still have that squared around. Okay, now in order to go from here, I have to take the square root of both sides. Okay, so essentially when I do that, um, you know, that square goes away, and I'm left with uh, actual uh, t value right here. So t equals um, square root of 2x, or final, so 2 times the final position minus the initial position um, minus the initial velocity times time. Uh, and that's all divided by the acceleration. So that's a little complicated, but yeah, yeah, we should have to deal with it. Okay, next one, solve for velocity. That's a little bit easier. Um, so this one is, uh, so one-half mass times velocity squared. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is divide by one-half mass on both sides. So I have k divided by one-half my mass equals my velocity squared. Okay, uh, again, anytime I divide by one half, it's the same thing as two times k divided by mass equals v squared. Uh, and I just want um, my regular velocity, so if I take a square root of both sides, then that will uh, eliminate this part right here. 
right? And so I get velocity equals um, two times k divided by uh, square root of two k divided by m. Okay, let's tackle this one. Now I'm gonna have to solve for this theta. Okay, solve for theta. That's what I'm being asked to do. Well, I have my equation here on the left. I got m's and g's and sines and cosines. Um, this will probably be one of the more complicated things we'll do. Um, and really in the class, this is doesn't pop up all that often. Okay, but um, so I have to solve for the theta. Now uh, I can't pull out that theta. It's not like I can pull you know do anything else with that. Um, what I will do is I will take this value right here and I'll add it to both sides. Um, so essentially you can say, think about it moving it over to the other side and making that negative becoming a positive. So I will do that one first. So let's, let me zoom in so I get my space. Uh, so this is my, uh, this is my mu right here, right? That's my symbol for, um, mu. <clears throat> So I'm going to write that out as mu m g uh, cosine theta is equal to, now this stuff over here stays on that side, uh, m g sine theta. Okay, um, so I will, I'm, I've got a little problem here, but I, I'm going to trust myself. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multi uh, divide both sides by m g right here. So I'm going to get rid of these. Um, this mg right here and get sine theta on itself. Um, I, you know, I could do a couple steps at once, but I need to get that theta all alone. Uh, but I'm gonna do this as the next step. All right, so mg. So my mass cancels, my gravitational acceleration cancels, my m's and my g's cancel on that side. I look at this. I got mass m divided by m, g divided by g. Um, so this simplifies down to mu cosine theta equals sine theta, okay? And and as a shortcut, you can kind of go, and you, anytime that you have, you know, these symbols that are the same on both sides, and there's not um, any addition and some other things complicated, you know, complicate it, then you can just go ahead and cancel right away. And that will be some neat things that happen when you uh, do that in physics. Um, all right, so I'm going to solve for the theta, uh, so what I'm going to do, go back to white, and so mu is equal to sine theta divided by cosine theta. Uh, okay, this is, you know, I, I, trig's not required for this class, but, you know, little things like this, maybe it pops in. Sine theta divided by cosine theta is the same thing as tangent of theta. All right, so essentially now I have, you know, this... I substitute this, so mu is equal to the tangent theta. And to get theta just alone, I'd have to do an inverse tangent. Okay? So now here's my final expression.